this is a perfect representation of what the marketplace is. And I'll just pause and kind of let you absorb this for a second. It's a time lapse from the Super Bowl in 2017. It's from the Houston parking lot. And it's a beautiful representation of what the marketplace is because this is what the marketplace is designed to do. It's designed to move riders and drivers efficiently to where they are and from where they are to where they need to go and to do it safely. Here we use new technology where you didn't even actually have to request an Uber. People, the game ended, people left, they walked to the parking lot, we had an Uber parking lot, and they just got into the Uber and went home. You didn't have to request, you could use a pin, walk in and head off on your merry way safely to your destination. We we're moving 10 cars every minute through this parking lot. And it was a really effective way to move people. And this is the beginning of our story tonight. So my name is Chintan Tharakya. I'm one of the engineering managers in Marketplace. And we'll do a little bit of deep dive into what the market, Marketplace is all about. First, machine learning is the key to Uber's future. And Uber is an awesome place to do it. The amount of data we have, you'll understand a little bit more as we go throughout the night, the complexity of the problems, uh, where we have a lot of data, where we don't have a lot of data, and the new techniques we're trying to deploy at scale in production to solve our problems. So the marketplace, you open up your Uber app, you type in a destination, you see a fare pop up, 10 bucks to take an UberX to go home. Cool, you click on it you get matched to a driver. So you as a rider get matched to a driver and you say, oh, a couple minutes away ETA, you get in the car, you get routed and you get to your destination safely. That's beautiful from a UI. It's a nice experience when you push a button and a car shows up. And now when you push a button, food shows up. But what the marketplace does for our ride sharing world is it's the algorithmic brain and the decision making engine for Uber. We have lots of different teams in the marketplace. Some of them are just listed here. Uh, driver positioning, which helps inform drivers where they should drive based on future demand or current demand. Uh, forecasting, which we'll talk about. Dynamic pricing, which you've probably experienced uh, long ago when you saw surge multipliers. Now today you just see, you know, fares are slightly higher because of increased demand, uh, things like that. So dynamic pricing is helping to uh, keep a good balance between supply and demand. And then matching, driver rider pricing, and overall health of the marketplace. These are some of the teams that are working on these real-time decision engines and algorithms that power, uh, power the brain of Uber. So in our marketplace, we have two sort of paradigms. One is models that describe the world. The other is decision engines that act on those models. What's a model that describes the physical world? That's what's different about Uber, first of all. We have to model the physical world that's changing all the time. So to say that last week or the last couple of weeks, the past is an indicator of the future, that's generally what we do in our machine learning lives. Like we look at historical data, train, build a model and deploy. But in Uber's world, the world changes so frequently, we can't necessarily rely on the past too much, right? We have to take it with a grain of salt because of our growth curve, because the world changes every day, every hour. So these models that describe the world are forecasting models, demand elasticity models. And decision engines that act on those models, they take the inputs from these models that describe the world, and they make decisions for a marketplace to generate efficiency. This can be pricing algorithms for the, drive, for the riders. They can be driver incentives to incentivize drivers to come out and, and uh, support Uber. And so some examples of machine learning we'll talk about related to the marketplace ride sharing business is forecasting. Owen's gonna talk about dispatch, and Vivek is gonna kind of close it up uh, for Marketplace to talk about how we actually measure our success, the success of our algorithms. And it's, to put it simply, we can't do A-B tests. He'll tell you why. So our responses to the world. I love this picture. You can stare at it for days or hours, I don't know. But it's this cat, and this is how we could be responsive to the world. How we could be, how we probably used to be. This is what Surge used to do. Saw a high area of demand, try to squash it. Saw another high area of demand, try to squash it by ensuring some supply exists. But this cat, I don't know if cats get tired, I don't have one, but we would get tired doing this all the time, trying to squash these hotspots. And if our responses to the world are not forward-looking, if they are reactive, if they are not extensible, we end up being like this cat. 
The goal is to make our marketplace levers, our pricing algorithms, our supply positioning algorithms, our dispatch algorithms, future aware. But the challenge is how do you actually see into the future? So you can start with forecasting. You can forecast supply, demand, other quantities. Supply for us, drivers. Drivers, cars that are available, people ready to drive, available driver minutes. Demand, the riders, people looking at the app, ready to get in an in a Uber. And there's other quantities we look at, like airport timetables and stuff like that. Jeff talked about this. It's a spatial temporal problem. We have space and time to deal with. Our spatial domain is complex because we can't just look at San Francisco as a whole. San Francisco has lots of unique pockets. Fidei, Inner Sunset, Outer Sunset, Richmond, et cetera. They're all unique based on the time of day, day of week. And we do this for different time horizons. Hourly for weeks ahead, by the minute, for a near-term horizon, it's a spectrum of forecasting. And so we build these custom stream processing engines, we take input data, we run some online features, uh, we use online features, historical features, and we generate billions of forecasts every minute to our decision engines, like our pricing engines, dynamic pricing for EATS, uh, which Charlie will talk about, or even to the driver app to inform drivers. And these space-time transformations are happening every minute, and we do it for what we call a hexagon, uh, which is about the size of a city block. So we're forecasting in an area that's pretty granular with sparse amounts of data. And it's not just simply as, hey, let's train a model using a ton of data, uh, and we'll get a good forecast. Like, there's clearly going to be difficulties with the amount of data and the granularity we need to go to. So you can look at history and plan for the future. That's fine. But how do you plan for this? Like, how do you plan for concerts, for soccer games? Um, I don't know who goes to polo matches, but those. And uh, baseball, basketball, or even what happened last year. If you all remember Jan in January, February time of last year, the women's marches happened. Millions of people came out to support a cause. They needed to get somewhere to make their voices heard, and they needed to get there safely. But it was unprecedented. It never happened before. But people needed to get from A to B. And this made a dent in our marketplace. We couldn't anticipate it. We didn't know what to expect. But this is the problem we have to solve, right? Because if you need to get somewhere, and if our promise as Uber is reliable transportation everywhere, anywhere, and you try to get that ride to go make your voice heard, you can't get that ride. That's our fault. Like, we need to make that possible. And that's the hard part about what we have to solve for. So how do you actually anticipate real-time shocks to the marketplace? If you look at some of these curves, you'll see like there's a spike towards the left, and then it dips down, and the green dots pick up again, and you see these oscillations. These are rider, driver, sorry, rider drop-offs and pickups. So a lot of drop-offs at the beginning of Friday night, dips down, and then a lot of pickups, uh, pickups and drop-offs on Saturday night. And these are the things that change our marketplace, that that cause us to make sure we want to make our decisions appropriately. So this ended up being some comedy festival that at that time last year, we never heard of this cluster fest. It's happening again if you want to go. But last year, no one anticipated like the impact of this. But we have to build for a world and use machine learning to make sure we capture all these occurrences and actually understand in real time like if it matters or not. What's really that hard? We can detect shocks and measure them after they happen. That's kind of easy, not really. But how do we actually do this before they happen? How early can we detect these shocks? And how do we deal with scenarios where we actually have no historical data, like the Women's March example that I gave you? It never happened before. So how do we actually train something on that? How do we anticipate what it's going to be like? So we start with, you know, do some regression. We use neural nets. Uh, and we build from the basics. We start with the basic features that we need. Last week, day of week, hour of day. And for us, speed and scale are, are very important. We want to experiment rapidly. We want to put things in production. But what if last week was a slow week? What if last week wasn't a good indicator of the future weeks? So we go back more in history, get better features. But what if it rained two weeks ago while, it was, while there was a concert on the Friday of Halloween? Like, that is this combination of really interesting occurrences that make a big difference to the marketplace. There was a huge uh, weather event 
uh, yesterday in New York City that shut down Grand Central St Station. Big dent to Uber because people needed to get somewhere. How do you anticipate, how do you model that? And so we pull context and events and weather and holidays from external vendors and go for it. And we build these embeddings into our models. And convolutions work pretty well here, um, as you can see, because we need to aggregate over space. So on the left is individual data points, lat longs of riders and drivers. But we need to aggregate that up to actually get some stronger signal out of the data, otherwise the data is too sparse. And this can very much be like an image problem. Convolutions actually help quite well in this, in this domain. But then we get to more interesting questions. You build one model for the world. Do you build one model for city? If you have, we're in 600 cities, do you build models for each of these spatial regions now? So you 10x, 100x this problem? Or how could we learn from events that are happening in New York City three hours ahead of us and use that to inform events that might be happening in San Francisco? How do we do this in real time? These are the problems we have to solve to make our decision levers are methods by which we make the network efficient in the marketplace future aware. <clears throat> and so what does it take to be good? It boils down to error, right? We can you look at naive forecasts, you get some error, you do deep forecasts, you get a lower error, great. But error comes from different places, weather events, holidays, endogenous factors uh, that Vivek will talk about. And this is at a coarse granularity. This is coarse relative for us. A city block for us is coarse. But what happens if your decision-making ability is, uh, the granularity of decision-making ability is like number one priority for you? If you need to make a pinpoint lat-long decision and match a rider to a driver, that granularity and the precision there is paramount to the success of matching. 